We gather here before God to express our gratitude for peace and for liberty, recognizing the price paid by others, a price we should never disregard or forget. We gather to pray for all who suffer still as a result of conflict and to commit ourselves to peace and the creation of a society in which all enmities, ancient and new, may be healed and in which young and old alike are cherished and justice can flourish for all. Long ago, the psalmist wrote, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth change. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let us worship God. We sing hymn 161, O God, our help in ages past. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. Let us pray. Please be seated. God of all generations, on this day of solemn remembering, we gather with many and mixed emotions. For some of us, war is the stuff of history books or visits to battlefields. 
for others among us, war is part of our own memory and our family story. Some of us see but names written on a memorial. Others still remember the faces that touch those names, however dimly with the passing of the years. Some, many, still remember the sadness and bitterness of loss. Yet we are glad that we are able to gather as one people this day, sharing our memories of the past and our hopes and fears for the future. God, who favors no one generation over another, deeming young and old alike to be precious in your sight, and listening to the stories and heeding the needs of each, help us to pray on this day of all days, even although many of us do not find it easy. Help us to sense that within all the mess and muddle of this world, you are still with us, not ruling from afar, but walking among us and beside us, prompting, inspiring, guiding, sometimes rebuking, sometimes weeping alongside us, sometimes weeping because of us, but always loving, forgiving, and making all things new. Forgive us for our sheer forgetfulness, forgetting so much of what has been won for us by others, forgetting that peace and liberty have not been won cheaply, forgetting all that is good and true comes ultimately from you, and forgetting that we too have our part to play in striving for peace and for justice. Forgive us and help us. Help us to remember that we live with gratitude, to remember in order that we might turn from the greed and the pride that lead to division, and to remember that you do not love us to struggle alone, leave us to struggle alone, but you have always been before us and with us, and that we have the example of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the inspiring presence of your Spirit. So let us walk more humbly and with deeper gratitude and greater confidence that we are loved and will be guided. Through Jesus Christ we pray, as in the words he taught us to say together, we pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'm very pleased indeed to welcome all of you here today for this remembrance service, and to welcome those who join us online. We're particularly pleased to welcome Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel McAllister, Deputy Lieutenant, representing His Majesty the King. We also are pleased to welcome members of the Royal British Legion Scotland, representatives of the Guides, the RAF Air Cadets and the Scouts, and we're pleased to have you all with us. If you're at the back, there are some young people at the front, and there's some young at heart at the back. And do you know what day it is today? Poppy day. Ah, Poppy Day, that's a, good, that's a good response. Not quite right, but we're going to talk about them. Do you remember? What do poppies represent? What? Exactly, remembrance. Poppies represent remembrance, and that's why we wear them on Remembrance Sunday, and more importantly, on the 11th of November, because that is Remembrance Day. It's a symbol of remembrance. It's worn by millions and millions of people. And do you know why it's red? Yep. Because poppies are usually red. We've got an expert at the front here. Did anybody at the back get that, that one? 
And it's important to remember that. Have you got another answer for me? Sorry? We'll come to that in a second. You're getting ahead. He's telling me there's different colors, but we'll come to that in a, in a second. Do you know what poppies aren't? That's a good Scottish aren't, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know what? They aren't a symbol of death. Some people think that's pretty nasty, aren't they? And they're not red because of blood. That would be pretty nasty as well. They're red because poppies are red. And why, and do you know why we choose poppies? As for remembrance. Well, long, long time ago, at the First World War, which is way over 100 years ago now, so it seems an awful long time, even to me, that there was an awful lot of fighting over northern France, and the ground was pretty, pretty rubbish. It's a bit like the path at the back of the Cathedral Hall just now. I, I thought that looked like the Somme battlefield on Friday when I walked across it. But out of all this mud and rubble and rubbish, these poppies grew up, and it reminded people of life coming through all of this. And a, a Canadian wrote a poem about it. I won't read it just now, but you all ought to read it when you get back home again. You can Google it. It's by McCrae, and it's called um, In Flanders Field. It's a good poem. But that made people think about it, and so an American after the war made poppies and started to sell them as a reminder. And at that time, the British Legion was set up, and they decided to buy some of these poppies from America. Obviously, an American import. That would be good for America. And they bought six million poppies, and they made 190,000 pounds for the British Legion. And just after that, in 1926, Lady Haig, who was the Errol Haig's wife, she decided that Scotland ought to have its own factory. So they built a factory just outside Edinburgh where, they made, where Poppy Scotland made Scottish poppies. And that's actually why Scottish poppies only have four petals and no leaf. So if you're wearing a leaf this morning, you've got an import. But not everybody uses poppies to remember, because we chose to use poppies to remember. The French, I didn't get one, but I used good old Mr. Google, and I got the nearest thing to it. They use a French cornflower as a remembrance, or a bleuet de France, if you prefer that. And the Belgians, Bit of a strange choice, but they choose. They chose a white daisy. A white daisy. Do you see that one? Would you prefer to wear a white daisy or a blue bluette rather than a red one? Doesn't matter, does it? It's what you're remembering. And some people wear white ones because they get, they think it's about peace and white being a colour of peace. They they choose peace to remember. In a way, it doesn't matter. They're all symbols. And they symbol to represent remembrance, remembering all those people from no, what, no matter what sides they're in to, to, who, who laid down their life or gave something so that we could be free. And a, 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 and a pop is a wee bit like a cross that we use as Christians. You see people wearing crosses sometimes and we use them around the churches and they're symbols of Christ. And they remind us that Christ died for us. But we have to remember that as well that Christ was a, is a God of peace, and he tries that we do things peaceably, and that we get on with each other. And if you remember last Sunday, we spoke about love, and we spoke about loving God and loving each other. And if we loved each other, we wouldn't have all these wars, and we wouldn't have to wear red poppies. But to remember all this, we'll give thanks to, to Jesus for being the Prince of Peace. And we'll give thanks to all those people who helped us through our life and who sacrificed for us as we sing together the hymn number 180, 
give thanks. With grateful hearts, we come to give thanks for sacrifice made on behalf of us and the generations to follow us. In the little parish church of Duffus in the northeast of Scotland, there is a war memorial inscribed by words by a classical scholar, John Maxwell Edmund. And the words go like this, went the day well. We died and never knew. Went the day well. We died and never knew. Those words are a telling reminder that those who lost their lives in conflict inevitably left work undone. How could it have been otherwise? Just as figures such as Martin Luther King left work undone. There was work to, still to be done in conquering racism after his assassination. Our remembering must always contain an element of commitment and resolve. Jesus spoke not of the blessedness of people who love peace, nor of the advocates and the appreciators of peace. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. People with resolve that we will be better and fairer and kinder men, women, and young people in a fairer, gentler world. And that we be people who give up something of ourselves in striving for that end. Abraham Lincoln, one of the great American presidents, who is remembered as a martyr and a national hero for his wartime leadership and for his efforts to preserve the Union and to abolish slavery, 
once stood on a Civil War battleground and spoke words that I believe each generation would do well to hear. Lincoln said, It is not for us to dedicate the memory of those who have fought and died. It is for us, rather, to be dedicated here to the great task remaining before us, that we here and now highly resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. I invite you now, if you're able, to stand, but if you're more comfortable seated, please feel free to do so. I invite you to stand. We come now to this time of quiet and respectful remembering. Remembering with silent regret that such great sacrifice was demanded of so very many, often in the very prime of their life. And with gratitude for peace and liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of faith, freedom to vote, achieved on behalf of the generations that followed and at such great cost. And this is a time of remembering those who did not return from war or other conflicts, and of acknowledging the pain and life-giving injuries, life-changing injuries of those who did return, but wounded in body, mind, or spirit, some of whom did die as a result of war long after the conflict ceased. This is a time of remembering the countless people whose hearts were broken and whose future was forever after tinged with sadness and regret. And this is a time of praying for those still caught up in human conflicts and those who still serve within our armed forces and emergency services, whose work takes them to a place of danger. We remember all those members of the armed forces who died in two world wars, in Korea, in the Falklands, in Northern Ireland, the former Yugoslavian republics, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and on the streets of this country. We remember members of the Merchant Navy who perished at sea and all who died not in battle but still as a consequence of war. We remember all who perished in their own homes or communities through bombing. And we remember those nations we once deemed to be enemies, but whose hearts were also broken and whose pain has been as real. And this time of remembering is also a time of recommitment to the reconciling purposes of God, whose Son Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Love one another as I have loved you. This is a time to remember the promises of God. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the former things have passed away. In silence, let us remember.
They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do your holy will through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We remain standing to sing hymn 712, 712, What Shall We Pray for Those Who Died? The first reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, but was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, 
now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him.
The second reading is taken from Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple te uh, treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, at this moment we align our souls with your truth. May the words spoken today resonate with our spirits, guiding us into a deeper understanding of your will and purpose for our lives. Amen. I always find it a bit of a challenge to stand up in a pulpit and face a congregation on Remembrance Sunday and to have that responsibility of trying to reflect on the sacrifice given by so many to firstly end the war that was to end all wars when we know that there's hardly been a year since 1918, since the British forces have not been on active service. Some experienced the Second World War, then Korea, Suez, the Falklands, Northern Ireland, two Gulf Wars, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and many, many more small conflicts around the world. Well, they're so called small unless you lost your son or daughter, your husband or your wife, your brother or your sister. In that case, they were still significant conflicts. I'm also challenged because I'm very aware that there's probably as many differing views on war in church today as there are people sitting here in this congregation. People see conflict in very different ways. Some believe it's abhorrent and should never happen. Others see that there are circumstances when it's necessary, when freedom is taken away or the significant injustice and negotiation fails to solve and find some form of resolution. Now, I still remember the last time I saw my father. He had served in the Second World War, ending as a prisoner of war in Hong Kong, where he stayed for several years. I said goodbye to him a couple of weeks before I deployed on the first Gulf War. The look on his eyes told me that there were certain things that he had seen and he had witnessed that he didn't want his son to either see or witness. We both went to our different wars in different eras, and we both felt that believed that we had done some good. 
he, he worked through his war and he thought it was difficult in Hong Kong as a prisoner of war, although it did serve to bring him closer to God and on return to the United Kingdom, he trained as a minister of the church. He stood there, and I remember him in many Remembrance Sundays, wearing his medals and remembering those colleagues who did not come back from Hong Kong. I believe that my service was a very, very tiny part in the freeing of the Kuwaitis from invasion and later on in bringing some form of relief to the Bosians in a later conflict. In that, I took my part in a UN peacekeeping force, another role for the military, but not without its dangers, as you tend to stand between two warring factions wearing a light blue berry. Like my father did, I also wear my medals thinking of those who didn't return, and thankfully, far fewer, but still many with life-changing injuries. Most people have some connection with conflict, and, and we've seen, as we see at this time of year on the television screens and our newspapers, many stories of military action in the Ukraine, in Gaza, in the Lebanon, in Israel, and I'll let you judge the relevant successes, but all of these conflicts affect families. They affect people. Many people seek information on how their relatives were involved in one of the wars and how that had sh shaped both their predecessor and their whole family tree because we're all affected by the experience and the scarring of fathers and mothers, of grandfathers and of grandmothers. And in, if you watched the program of Remembrance yesterday evening, you'd see several films of individuals, of families, of people who were directly touched by the effects of war in the last few decades. And in preparation for this morning, I, I read a book again written by a former moderator called John Miller, who had a parish in Castle Milk in Glasgow. And he decided some years ago to go around the parish and collect stories and recollections of the two world wars before they were lost. And their book recalls many parishioners' memories of their involvement, their life stories, and the way that war touched and shaped their lives. Some were personally involved, others affected by relative or by friend. And he interviewed a Mrs. Joan Victoria Knox, who at the time of writing in 1996 was a tall and elegant lady who had lived in Castle Milk since Castle Milk had been built in 1955. And although she was then 89 years old, she kept herself fit and went swimming twice a week and walked the half mile to church every Sunday. She talked of both wars, about the family members called up, her father was called up to serve in the first war, other relatives in the second, as well as her memories of wartime life in Glasgow. And this included her experience of her great disappointment with Chamberlain when he failed to gain peace from Germany, and then following that with the bombing of Glasgow, the evacuation of children, the experience of neighbors as they suffered both from the bombing, from rationing, and from losing loved ones abroad. On Remembrance Sunday, she says, on Remembrance Sunday, I think that terrible thought of all the young ones that died, the millions in the two wars, it's that, that comes back, and how lucky we were. I always think of a friend of my sister's, a nicer couple you couldn't get, he was a prisoner of war and spent years in Belson too. And although he came home, he needed to go on operation and, and died from that. I think of my young uncle Danny too, the one who drowned and was never found. He had just married when he, when he went off on that voyage. I think of those two and I think of them all. 
You ask me if I'm a religious person. I wonder. I will not work on a Sunday. I never do my washing on a Sunday. I won't buy messages on a Sunday. I make Sunday a day of rest. I like to set one day aside to think about the things that matter in life. I think God wants to protect a good way of life. And sometimes that will mean fighting evil. And if you just stood back and did nothing about it, then evil would get on, would get on getting away with it. And surely war is bad. I'm so glad that the big nations are trying to do something about it. But it's terrible that war is still going on. I pray for peace in my prayers every day. For myself, one of my personal memories is that of a young officer who returned at the same time as myself from the first Gulf War. And a senior officer came to visit his barracks. And at that time, in the mid-90s, there was early 90s rather, there were several senior officers who hadn't had service and weren't wearing medals. And he pressed the junior officer on the lessons that he had learned during the Gulf War, which would better prepare him for his next war. And the young officer looked up at this senior officer and said, only those who have never been to war wish to go to war. In the reading from Mark, we see Jesus comment on two very different groups of people, the scribes and the widow. The scribes walked around in their posh robes looking for respect whilst they ignored their responsibilities. They sold off and spent resources intended to be used to support the widows. These were the men in, of the temple that Jesus was trying to explain through scriptures that he was truly the Messiah, the promised one. And the scribes were not prepared to open their minds. They were, they were quite prepared to make decisions based on their personal needs and their position rather than the position and the needs of the people that they served. They were certainly willing to sacrifice Jesus to maintain the status quo. And this was getting closer. But Jesus also spoke of the widow who was prepared to give to the treasury her whole life, which was represented by these two small copper coins, which was all that she had to live on that day. Her sacrifice, however small, was absolutely total. And we can see the linkage with this simple act and the sacrifice of Jesus, the one that he would make on the cross. The sacrifice that the widow made is similar to the sacrifice that's been made by many and still make it in wartime today, this week, this day. The widow also reminds us of all those left on their own when the soldiers are deployed. She was a widow. And these left to cope in very challenging conditions whilst those, are, those around them often ignore them their situation, and simply get on with their own lives. And this takes us straight back to the suffering of those in the battlefield and those suffering back at home. For some, the suffering was short. For others, the suffering was long and painful. And it still is for many. It's very difficult, or, or rather it's impossible, to try and respond to this suffering with simple, naive platitudes. It's important for us to see what the scribes did not see, that Christ did suffer once for us, and that he stands beside us all through our lives, the good times and the challenging. And we've all heard the old saying that there are no agnostics on the battlefield. Jesus is the high priest who intercedes on our behalf, no matter what our situation. 
And we must also reflect on the scribes who are still with us, those powerful people who are happy to bolster the position and use power without taking any recognition of the cost of those affected by the outcome of their decisions and words. The scribes didn't worry about the widows. There are still those who still see war as a way of achieving ambition and not really acknowledging the true suffering and loss that their political or power-driven decisions have started. We see the evidence of this sort of behavior in our lifetime. We see it today. And sadly, we'll probably see more of it tomorrow. We don't have to look too far to see some politicians who use the poor and the outcasts as a focus of fear to help with their ambitions rather than trying to resolve the problem and the suffering. But maybe we should really reflect on the widow, the one who truly represents those who gave and give their all, their lives and their futures for the benefits of others. She didn't end up with any worldly medals, but she certainly brought a tear to God's eye. She gave all that she could to support God's work here on earth without any hesitation, just as many did during the wars that our society has experienced. And so we pray for peace and the love of Christ. Let us pray. We entrust to you, eternal God, those times when we can see only shadows and lose the sight of the hope to come. The times when suffering seems so senseless, life so fragile, war so unstoppable, and death so permanent. Bless us with the assurance that you are in all things, the tragic and the beautiful, the nightmare and the dream, the light and the darkness. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the peace of the world, today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. And we reflect on that as we sing together the hymn which is in your hymn sheets. Hope for the world's despair, we feel the nation's pain.
Let us pray. On this day of remembering the sacrifice of many, let us dedicate ourselves and all we have to offer to the service of Christ, to the bringing of peace, to the good of all. And this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray, giving our thanks and bringing our concerns. God of peace and persistent love, let us be people of gratitude as we remember what the generations before us have handed on to us. Those who have worked hard to ensure that we have the gift of education and health care. Those who have framed our laws, seeking justice for all people. Those who have shaped our nation and communities for good. And let us remember, especially this day, with gratitude, those who gave of themselves in seeking to protect this country, to spare future generations from tyranny, and to strive for peace. We pray for all who still serve in the armed forces and the emergency services, who work in our prisons and communities, seeking to protect to maintain justice, to build order. And we remember all those of the armed forces who have been injured in more recent conflicts, striving to rebuild lives without limbs or struggling to banish their demons, the horrors that they have witnessed. And we pray for a country and a world that will never forget those who have paid a higher price than we can easily appreciate or understand. We pray for Charles, our King, for Camilla, the Queen, and for all the royal household. And we pray for those who govern us in Westminster and Holyrood, guide the leaders of this nation and all nations, that they find the way that leads to peace, justice, and reconciliation. And we pray for the people who still live in the midst of conflict, for the people of Gaza and Israel and the West Bank, for the people of Ukraine and Russia and all places where conflict persists. Broken-hearted God, your ways are the ways of gentleness and all your paths are peace. Speak to the hearts of those intent on hatred and extermination. Open the borders of many lands that those who most despair may find a place of refuge and safety. Visit the hungry, the thirsty, the injured, and the terrified with the transforming grace of your love. Uphold all who have experienced horror and who fear worse to come. Empower the international community that it may bring reason and understanding and may strive for peace. And change the souls of us all that we might see through our, en through our enemy our only path to you. And we pray for young people in our uniformed organizations that their voices be heard and their gifts and inspirations valued. And we pray for older people and those who are now too frail to join us in person as we remember. And remember those drawing closer to the end of this life and all who are ill. Give to them strength the reassurance of family and friends around them, and at the last, that peace that this world can never fully give nor take away. And all these prayers we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen.
you are very warmly invited to join us for tea and coffee at the end of the service over in the cathedral halls, and we'd be very pleased indeed to see you there. And there will be an act of remembrance at the Dumblain Memorial Service, the War Memorial rather, at 12.30, and again, you're very warmly invited to that. And there will be a service of remembrance this afternoon in Kincardine and Minteith Church at three o'clock, and again, you're welcome to that as well. I've been asked by the stewardship team to thank all who have responded to this congregation's review of giving, and further responses, by way of reminder, will be gratefully received, and an information pack on how you can support the church's work through your giving is available from members of the team at the end of the service or at coffee. And I remind you also of the other intimations on the order of service. We sing hymn 740, 740, for all the saints who from their labors rest.
God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the king, the commonwealth, and all people, unity, peace, and concord, and to all us and all God's servants, life everlasting. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you always. Amen. God save the King.